<laughs> Good morning, everyone. If I could encourage all of you to, to find your seats, uh, we're going to get started shortly. Um, I'm Blaise Mishtal, the Director of Foreign Policy here at the Bipartisan Policy Center. And my pleasure to welcome all of you today to this event. I don't think I uh, need to necessarily give a, a long introduction to, to what this is about and what we want to talk about today. Um, but let me just start by saying that almost exactly a year and a half ago, I'm not sure if, if you remember Ambassador Edelman, we met in the same space to release the first paper uh, from the Bipartisan Policy Center's Turkey Initiative, which was on U.S.-Turkish cooperation toward a post-Assad Syria. We handed them out today. I encourage all of you to take a look. Um, given what has transpired in the last 18 months, I wanted to revisit some of what we wrote in that paper. Uh, and the following are direct quotes. A prolonged conflict in Syria not only spells continued suffering for Syrians, but also endangers regional stability as the fighting continues to send refugees and violence into neighboring countries ill-equipped to deal with either. Cooperation with Turkey, however, will prove challenging. While relations between Washington and Ankara have prospered in recent years, Turkey has resented America's unwillingness to help the opposition bring down Assad. More importantly, disagreements between Turkey and the United States over which elements of Syria's opposition to support suggest that the two countries will have to overcome somewhat divergent visions of what a post-Assad Syria should look like and how to get there. And finally, Turkey's at least tacit support for the growing role of Islamist militants in Syria may prove a short-term benefit but at long-term significant cost. History suggests that jihadi groups have always created more problems than solutions. Uh, unfortunately, in the, in the 18 months since we wrote that, the gulf between the United States and Turkey uh, seems to have widened. Last year, Ankara and Washington at least shared a similar objective, ousting Assad, even if they had different motivations. Today, the two can't even agree on what they've agreed on, let alone on what the major threat in the region is and how to address it. An important factor, though certainly not the only one, in these divergencies between the United States and Turkey have been the Kurds. And we sort of find ourselves in a... In a bizarre situation in which the United States and Turkey are allies, the United States and ISIS are enemies, the Kurds and ISIS are enemies, and logic would seem to dictate that therefore Turkey should be on the same side as the Kurds and against ISIS. Yet last week, Turkish President uh, Erdogan declared for us the PKK is the same as ISIL. It is wrong to consider them as different from each other. So to try to discuss the relationships between the U.S. and Turkey, Turkey and ISIS, Turkey and the Kurds, and, and sort of what this all means for the possibility of addressing the conflict in the region. Uh, I'm pleased to have with us two members of our, of our Turkey initiative. Unfortunately, the third, Svante Cornell, came down with the flu this morning and is unable to join us. Next to me is Ambassador Eric Edelman. He's a senior advisor to the BPC and co-chair of our Turkey initiative. He is also the Roger Hurtog Distinguished Practitioner in Residence at the Philip Merrill Center for Strategic Studies at the Johns Hopkins University School of Advanced International Studies and a senior associate of the International Security Program at the Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs at Harvard University, both very long titles. While in the U.S. Foreign Service, Ambassador Edelman served as Undersecretary of Defense for Policy in the George W. Bush administration, and as ambassador in Ankara at another moment in time when the U.S. was seeking Turkish support for military operations in the region. Next to him is Dr. Henri Barki, also a member of our Turkey Initiative, and the Bernard L. and Bertha F. Cohen Professor of International Relations at Lehigh University. He previously served as a member of the U.S. State Department Policy Planning Staff, working primarily on issues related to the Middle East and the Clinton administration, and has taught at Princeton, Columbia, the State University of New York, and the University of Pennsylvania. He's a brilliant analyst of Turkey. He's traveled in the, in the Kurdish regions of Turkey. Uh, he writes prolifically in various periodicals, as well as authoring, co-authoring, and editing numerous books, including... Uh, speaking to today's topic, Turkey's Kurdish question. I also wanted to call out in the audience Senator Byron Dorgan, senior fellow with the BPC. We're pleased to have him here. Um, so sort of diving into our discussion, maybe we could start with a little context and background, um, starting with Turkey's relations to Syria and, and the Syrian conflict. So you know, Ambassador Edelman, perhaps you could sort of run us through the last three years really quickly of, of Turkish-Syrian relations and, and, and how we got to the point where we currently are. Uh, well, thank you, Blaze. I, I would just only add uh, to what you said. It's not only that the U.S. and Turkey appear not to agree on what they agreed on. I think it may also be the case that they can't agree on what they don't agree on. Um, so uh, the situation has a, a certain amount of um, perplexity about it. Uh, with regard to Syria, I mean, I think uh, Turkish-Syrian relations have, you know, gone through 
several phases and to go back you know, even further uh, in the late 90s, um, it's uh, probably worth recalling in the current context uh, that at a time when the um, regime of the Assad regime of um, Hafez al-Assad was uh, hosting uh, Abdullah Ocalan in, in Damascus, uh, that, uh, that Turkey uh, mobilized uh, a number of troops on the uh, Turkish-Syrian border and uh, was at least intimating it might be prepared to use them uh, against the Syrian regime unless they uh, actually sent Ocalan on his way, which they did. Uh, they sent him um, sort of careening around the world until um, he was um, brought back to Turkey, trussed up like a... Um, like a Thanksgiving turkey, uh, thanks to some uh, assistance from um, uh, other intelligence services. Um, but the nature of the relationship uh, began to shift, and it certainly shifted quite a bit um, once the uh, AKP came to power uh, in, um, in 2002. And um, for a period of time under Bashar al-Assad, there was a bit of a, a honeymoon. Uh, in fact, it was an unusual thing because uh, the Turkish government's honeymoon with Assad uh, was, uh, in fact, occurring during a period when, uh, as a result of the assassination of Rafiq Hariri in Beirut, most of the rest of the international community was intent on isolating uh, the Assad regime, which was uh, being blamed uh, most in most quarters for having uh, either uh, authored or uh, certainly uh, approved of the assassination of Hariri in Lebanon. And it was those events, uh, as many will recall, that uh, gave birth to the Cedar Revolution and the um, uh, withdrawal of Syrian forces from Lebanon after long occupation. Um, so the Turks were, in some sense, at variance with an international consensus about how to deal with Assad before um, the outbreak of the Arab Spring and the civil war in, in Syria, uh, which uh, began in, in March of, of 2011. Uh, initially, um, the government attempted to capitalize on this earlier rapprochement with Assad in the hope that they could influence uh, Assad. And, um, then Foreign Minister, now Prime Minister Ahmed Davutoglu went to, uh, went to Syria, spent hours and hours in, in meetings with Assad, uh, counseled him against using uh, military repression uh, against the, at that point, uh, largely peaceful protests that had broke out, broken out against the regime. Um, and that proved to be completely uh, unsuccessful. Um, and I think the general drift of the conversation was that um, President Assad told um, Prime Minister Davutoglu, or Foreign Minister Davutoglu, and, and through him, uh, Prime Minister, then Prime Minister, now President Erdogan, you know, thank you very much for your interest in Syrian national security. Um, we have a different way of, of dealing with this. Um, in some sense, I think it's important to recall all this because I do think that there was a, a there was and is a high degree of personal pique and animosity that drives both President uh, Erdogan and uh, Prime Minister Davutoglu in their policy towards Syria, which it should be noted remains extremely unpopular in Turkey as measured by public opinion polls. That is a policy of intervention in Syrian internal affairs to, to overthrow Assad. I should say, I, I, having said all that, I actually do uh, sympathize and to some degree agree with the fundamental um, diagnosis that uh, Erdogan and Davutoglu have made. I don't believe there's any uh, resolution possible in, um, in the Syrian imbroglio absent the departure of Assad. Uh, but uh, that, I think, colored the approach that the Syrian government has uh, taken. Uh, as we said in our report, there was a lot of uh, superficial commonality in the U.S. and the Turkish approaches, but I think it, uh, it, it papered over very deep differences about how to approach this. And I think it's worth recalling that when then Secretary Clinton had to try and deal with uh, Foreign Minister Davutoglu on this, there was just an enormous amount of disappointment 
about um, the unwillingness of the U.S. to step up and take a larger leadership role in Syria, to push harder to oust Assad, uh, to provide material assistance to the opposition. Um, there was an effort to try and uh, compose those differences by appointing working groups to meet and discuss the issues further. Um, and over the last three years, nothing has really come of that, and it has led to persistent frustration on the part of the uh, Turkish government. Unfortunately, the Turkish government also uh, then left to its own devices, as it were, uh, clearly decided to pursue a path of um, reorienting its policy. We've discussed that in some of the other papers we've written as a task force uh, in, in the direction of a policy that was more oriented towards um, Sunni majoritarianism, uh, not only in Turkey but in the region, uh, and as a result of that embarked on a very dangerous path of providing a lot of assistance and certainly uh, an easy path into Syria uh, for extremist groups. And uh, to some degree, the uh, broader situation that we're all dealing with now is not solely a, a result of that policy choice, uh, but it, it certainly uh, reflects some of the results of that policy choice. Why don't I stop there? And Henri, Eric, sort of talked about how in its opposition to Assad, the, the Turkish government sort of was choosing various actors to support. Uh, can you maybe give us a, a rundown of some, some of the, the actors that are in play in Syria? We have the, sort of the Free Syrian Army is the main Syrian opposition, but there's also, we've had the emergence of various Islamic militant groups. We have the Kurds, sort of, can you explain how the Turkish government has, has aligned itself with, with these over time? Well, look, from the beginning, the Turkish government decided that it would support uh, essentially uh, all opposition to, well, I should say the moderate opposition, or what we now call the moderate opposition to Assad. I mean, if you have to remember that the, the, the revolt against Assad went through stages. It was peaceful initially, and then it became, it turned violent, and, and people started taking up arms against the regime. And then um, you saw, first you saw the formation of political groupings, a lot of them on uh, the first activities, I should say, is where took place in Turkey. The Turks were very involved in helping f create um, and develop the opposition against, uh, political opposition against Assad. And then the Free Syrian Army was formed. The Free Syrian Army was based in Turkey and operated from Turkey. In other words, people crossed the border from Turkey. So you, you, you see a pattern essentially that developed from early on of heavy Turkish involvement. Um, the Turks were also um, played an important role in the interplay, if you want, within the opposition as to who should be on top. And you had obviously the Saudis, the Qataris, who, who also got involved. And there's a way in which, the, I mean, uh, people will tell you now that the Turks were heavily supportive of the uh, Syrian Muslim Brotherhood. And the relationship and the problems with the Kurds started almost at the from the beginning because uh, the Kurds in Syria decided that, look, this is an opportunity for us. They've been in opposition to the regime for a very, very long time. Um, and what they wanted to do was essentially get the opposition, uh, the polit new political opposition, to recognize that um, this, the Syrian Kurds, like the Iraqi Kurds, had a distinct identity. And in fact, when you think about uh, some of the issues that was discussed, one was the name of Syria. Syria officially is called the Syrian Arab Republic, and the Kurds said, you know, take the, take the Arab word out of that, you know, Syrian Republic is fine. And there was an enormous clash over the simple, over very simple, you would think, issues. Um, so th there was never any um, convergence, if you want, between the Syrian Kurdish groups and Turkey and, and, and the main opposition. And in fact, today the Turks claim that the Syrian Kurds have sided with, with Assad, which is actually not true. Um, but that's the, the line that the, the Turks um, pushed. But the problem for Turkey was that uh, absent American intervention, which they hoped and Eric addressed, and I think people misunderstood that, um, that Obama uh, Obama administration's intention. I mean, from the very, very beginning, it was very clear that um, this administration was not going to get involved in Syria, and understandably so. I mean, I, it came to power basically on a platform of 
against wars in the Middle East, more American troops in the Middle East. So that was understandable. I mean, one can argue about how clear the message was and what Obama should have said, and I, I can come back to that later on. But the, the two disappointments for, for Turkey was this, somehow this expectation that America would come. And remember, in, in 2003, when the United States intervened in Iraq, the Turks vehemently were opposed to that uh, intervention. At the time, Abdullah Gül had said, he was um, prime minister, he said, look, this is a regional problem, let the regional countries resolve it. Ten years later, um, uh, you had a different situation where, where the Turkish government was saying, come on, America, do something about it. Uh, look, again, it's understandable. There was an enormous amount of carnage. Nobody in the region wanted to get involved. And the other disappointment was that the Free Syrian Army turned out to be maybe free, but not very effective. And as, as divisions within the opposition, within the Free Syrian Army, made them very, very ineffective, the Turks had started to essentially um, uh, look for alternatives. And who were the alternatives? Well, the whole bunch of jihadist groups were emerging, and among them are Jabhat al-Nusra. And, and here is where you see the major disagreement between the United States and, 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 and Turkey, and also in terms of where we are today. After a certain point, Turkey became a major conduit for all kinds of jihadist uh, uh, people. And there are in numerous groups in, in, um, in, in Syria, obviously, of different shades um, and, and persuasions. But Jabhat al-Nusra was probably the most important group. And the Turks always claimed that they did not support Jabhat al-Nusra, but you, you do see both in the open literature and from what one hears from uh, US government sources, that in effect, yes, Jabhat al-Nusra was the primary beneficiary of Turkish largesse. We know that certain groups like IHH were very much involved in, um, in supporting and passing, not only bringing people across the border, but supplying arms and all kinds of things to, to the Jabhat al-Nusra folks. The problem, unfortunately, is that this, uh, what, what emerged now in Turkey is an infrastructure that supports the jihadist network. That infrastructure initially may have been supported or, or, or acknowledged or accepted by the Turkish government, but today is probably quite independent of, um, of, the, of the Turkish government. So you do have people in Turkey who are now on the side of ISIS. The problem is that once somebody crosses the border from Turkey into Syria and they say, well, uh, I'm going to, to fight with Jabhat al-Nusra, you don't really know if that's what they're going to do, right? I mean, it's not as if they sign a piece of paper and notarize and say and, and promise you um, this and that. Um, and also, when you look at Jabhat al-Nusra, there's been a lot of uh, bleeding from Jabhat al-Nusra into ISIS because ISIS seems to be more powerful, more successful, seems to be the the group now that we, the world has, un, um, has made the, uh, has become the enemy of the, uh, of the United States, so therefore has a lot more cachet than any, anybody else, and therefore there's a natural tendency to go with the successful one. So, and that infrastructure that I mentioned, that informal infrastructure that exists in Turkey, that when somebody lands in Istanbul and wants to join, um, anybody in, in Syria, they get picked up, they get transported, they get kept in safe houses, even when, and when the moment comes, they, they cross the border. So there is all this I infrastructure. And we see, we see now groups in Turkey who, which are um, openly supportive of ISIS. Uh, depending on who you talk to, I saw the Washington Post this weekend said 400 Turkish fighters with ISIS. Uh, my understanding is that the Turkish government official, um, unofficially behind uh, closed doors says 600 Turks are fighting with ISIS. And there were um, earlier reports that at least 1,000 are, are, are fighting. So I'll, I'll take the Turkish government number, which is probably conservative anyway, uh, of 600. That in of itself is a fairly, fairly large number if you think about it. And it is also a threat ultimately uh, to Turkey. But it is indicative of the involvement now of Turkey in uh, in. Uh, in um, the civil war, if you want, in, in, in Syria, and also how many Turks are involved with ISIS. That doesn't mean that Turkey supported ISIS. I don't think, I actually don't believe that Turkey of, at any point in time wanted to or tried to support ISIS. 
that its policy so Jabhat al-Nusra essentially probably helped ISIS indirectly and, and this is where we are today. So let me just sharpen the question. So you, you said that one of the reasons that, that Turkey at least tolerated the existence of Jabhat al-Nusra and other maybe sort of further leaning groups was the question of effectiveness. The Free Syrian Army wasn't a very effective force in fighting against the Assad regime. Was that the, the only motivation? Were there other factors at play? Look, I actually, I actually do think it's a question of, uh, you know, you're looking, I mean, l let, me, let me step back for one moment. As Eric explained, I mean, Turkey made a huge investment in Syria before the Arab Spring started, right, in terms of very good relations. If you think about the relationship between Syria and Turkey uh, before the Arab Spring, it was really the best example of the zero problems policy of, of uh, the two, Assad and, and Erdogan essentially were, uh, their families were, were um, friends, I mean, they became family friends, they traveled, they once at least said that I know of, uh, vacation together, uh, the two governments had multiple joint cabinet mem uh, meetings, right? Uh, so the relationship was very, very tight. And then when, this Arab Spring, when the revolt in Syria started, the Turks did say to the Assad, look, we will support you. Just do some things. Don't use force. Um, do something. In fact, um, they even said, look, you can have a sham election. We will support you. But Assad would not hear of it. And, and so once the break took place, there was the expectation on the part of Turkey that look, we are influential, we are far more important and far more powerful than, than as the Assad regime, therefore the Assad regime has to fall. I mean, kind of the good housekeeping seal, if you want, uh, in the region, and Assad resisted. And, and so the expectation in Turkey, as by the way in Washington too, was that Assad had six months. Well, many six months have gone by, and he's still there, and, and the problem is it, this looks terrible for Turkey. It, it is a major uh, political problem for, for, the, for the government, right? And um, it is a source of instability for, on t t t Turkey's. I mean, from all aspects, it's bad. Therefore, they desperately want Assad to go. So you have a free Syrian army that is ineffective. So you start looking for, I mean, it, it isn't that they decided to choose Jabal. I mean, they found Jabal al-Nusra because these guys were fighting. They were much more effective, they're blowing themselves up, and they were getting more results. Pastor Elman, other no, potential motivations? I, well, no, I don't really have much to, you know, to add to what Henri said. Um, I, I mean, to be fair, I mean, this is a huge, huge burden on Turkey, what's happened. I mean, Turkey's hosting over a million um, Syrian refugees. Um, I think outside of Jordan, I think they've got the second largest refugee population um, on their territory. It's a huge burden on the, on the Turkish state and on, on Turkish citizens uh, in the region. Um, so uh, this is a very, very large uh, problem, and I think the uh, Turkish government was trying to use those um, instruments to uh, which it found in hand, as, as Henri said. Um, but I also do think, you know, there is this um, larger ideological context in which a shift from a policy of zero problems with neighbors um, very quickly in a context of sharpening Shia, <coughs> Sunni antagonisms uh, in the region at large uh, devolved into a, um, a um, policy of Sunni solidarity. And so sort of four months ago, everything in a way changed with ISIS rampaging through Iraq and capturing Mosul, it suddenly became not just a problem within Syria, but, but a bigger regional problem, and suddenly with the beheading to American journalists uh, uh, rose to prominence for the United States as well. How has Turkey's relationship to ISIS sort of evolved over the last four months? Well, I think this is one of the sources of um, the kind of misprision and continued talking past one another that I think we see between the uh, U.S. government and the Turkish government, which is to say that I think the Turkish government sees ISIS for sure as a problem. I don't think they see them as a positive force or development, um, but they don't think of it as the worst problem in the region, certainly not the worst problem uh, that they face. 
Um, I think uh, a, uh, a Turkish government official was quoted in the Washington Post uh, a week or so ago, and I think Henri and I quoted, um, quoted that from the Post in an uh, op-ed that we did together, um, suggesting that you know, basically a, a lot of Turks think of ISIS as just a bunch of misguided uh, Muslim youth, that you know, some of their methods are really appalling, but you know, they're, they're you know, not as big a problem as, uh, as uh, the PKK, and I think somebody quoted the uh, President Erdogan to that effect uh, during the course of this discussion. Um, you know, I think you get a little bit of the sense of that from the comments of a former Deputy Prime Minister who, uh, after some of the violence broke out in, in the Southeast uh, uh, with uh, Turkish uh, Kurds um, uh, demonstrating curfews being put in place in various cities, a number of people being killed, unfortunately, uh, you know, one uh, former deputy prime minister said, you know, look, PKK is worse than ISIS because they torture their victims before they kill them. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I think that gives you a sense of the hierarchy for the, uh, the Turkish leadership. We see it as the biggest problem. They see it as one of several problems and not the highest one on their agenda. Look, I... For Turkey, the problem uh, in, in, in Syria, I mean, let's put Iraq aside for a moment, um, has been almost from the beginning Assad. I mean, Assad, I mean, the, the Assad's re resistance, so to say, has been the most problematic issue. But beyond that, right, uh, is the fact that as the, the Kurdish party PYD became more and more powerful in, in, in northern Syria and established this system of free uh, cantons and clearly this, uh, was going on the path of the Iraqi Kurds of creating its own autonomous region. Um, and given the fact that the PYD is affiliated or is a sister organization of the PKK, and so th for, the, for the Turks strategically, especially at a time when they are in negotiations with the PKK of a, an Erdogan in some, some kind of solution to the Turkish Kurdish problem, the emergence of another autonomous region in northern Syria well, is too, too much to bear strategically. And, and hey, you, Henri, maybe you can give us some context about the different Kurdish groups across the region and, and a little more insight on Turkish uh, relations with all of them. So, I mean, you have Kurds all over the place. I mean, the, let's put the Iranian Kurds who are so at the moment do not seem to be exceedingly active over something starting that too, from my, I gather. But um, you have the Iraqi Kurds, you have the Kurdistan regional government that has established an, uh, an autonomous region after 2003 that is recognized as part of the Iraqi constitution. Uh, the KRG is uh, a quasi-state and its leader, uh, Masoud Barzani, when he comes to Washington, can actually be received at the White House, so he has a great deal of international recognition. Um, in Turkey, you have obviously uh, a long Kurdish problem. We've had an insurrection since roughly 1984. Uh, Turkish Kurds are divided, I mean, between the PKK and a lot of them also support the AKP. Um, but the, the PKK has been the most important political force in terms of pushing the Turkish government into changing policies, uh, and now the Turkish government, this Turkish government, to its credit, has decided to resolve this problem politically and started some years ago to engage both the PKK military leadership but especially the, the imprisoned leader, Öcalan, uh, in negotiations. And, and, you know, it's been very slow. Like, all such negotiations are inevitably are, are, are slow. I mean, they cannot go fast. You have to prepare the public and um, the lot of the lots of details to, to negotiate. So it's been going on very slowly, but here comes the P PYD, which is essentially um, PKK sister organization in, in Syria, the strongest group. And in some ways, what's interesting and what I think people, a lot of people mi missed is that for many years, I think the PKK had been preparing the PYD, had been arming, had been uh, training the, um, the PYD. So when the insurrection started in Syria, the PYD very quickly managed to establish itself and also showed quite a, uh, an ability to resist ISIS. I mean, ISIS has, look, let's face it, in Kobani, ISIS has thrown enormous amount of resources against the Kurds that, and they've been resisting. I mean, they, you know, the Kobani may still fall. I'm not, I'm not sure, uh, you know, we're not sure if it's going to survive or not. But so you do see a very um, resilient um, and I'll have a few more things to say about Kobani later, but 
um, you have a very resilient uh, group in, in, in Syria. But precisely because of that, it is seen as a problem for Turkey because imagine, imagine a, a, a post-Assad Syria, and one day it will come, it has to, uh, um, where you have essentially another autonomous Kurdish region on Turkey's borders, just like the KRG. So Turkey now is surrounded by two Kurdish regions, and its own, its own Kurds will want essentially will be, there's a demonstration effect. I mean, if they get it, why, why shouldn't we? I mean, why are we different? And so that's, that's a very important strategic problem for Turkey, understandably. I mean, any Turkish government would, would want to, um, to stop that. And so for Turkey, that has always been a, as important a priority as getting rid of Assad. And the truth is, if Assad had gotten, if Assad had disappeared very quickly after the beginning of insurrection in, uh, in after March 2011, maybe the Syrian Kurds would not have been in a position to assert the kind of power they're asserting now, right? So every day that goes by, and I would argue that the resistance in Kobani is actually strengthening the Syrian Kurds, even if they lose Kobani, um, that in the end, uh, that Turkey faces a much more powerful Syrian um, Kurdish uh, movement, if you want. So that has been the, the, the main problem for, for, for Turkey uh, in Syria. So, so when Kobani emerged, of course, the, the, the fighting, and the Turks have been reluctant to, to uh, I mean, they, I think they would rather see Kobani fall. That doesn't mean they support ISIS. I mean, let's, let's be clear about it. It's not that they support ISIS, but, but in some ways for them, Another 200,000 refugees is acceptable price to pay in the midterm against a strategic success for the PYD in northern Syria. Right? That's, that's the trade-off. I mean, look, all, all, all countries essentially make trade-offs, and that for, for this particular government in Turkey at this particular point in time, when they are in negotiations with the PKK, they think that um, they need to have a stronger hand, and they don't want the PKK to have a stronger hand, and that's as simple as that. You know, if I could add, um, Blaze, to what um, Henri has said, I mean, both my comments and Henri's comments, I think, speak to the issue of the kind of hierarchy of objectives that the government has, and, and obviously the Kurdish uh, question looms very large in that, uh, larger than anything else, as Henri, I think, just very persuasively argued. There is, though, a kind of a separate ISIS dimension uh, that I think we need to, you know, bear in mind here, and it it also speaks to um, what Henri discussed earlier, which is the um, disappointment that Turks have felt about uh, the uh, U.S. administration's unwillingness to uh, to lead more and to uh, be willing to uh, put more military resources into the problem. Um, Turks are very well aware, particularly because of the fact that, uh, as we both uh, discussed earlier, there's been a lot of uh, traffic through southeastern Turkey into Syria by ISIL and Jabhat al-Nusra, um, that, that they live right next to this problem and we are very far away. I mean, we may be exercised by, or the American public may be exercised by the beheading of uh, two American journalists uh, and some British aid workers, but, you know, the, the Turks have to live with the consequences of whatever is done there uh, long after that, um, that anger may have dissipated in the West. And, uh, you know, we, we did have this episode where uh, uh, ISIS took uh, 46 Turkish diplomats hostage in Mosul. They thankfully have now been released. But I would say that the uh, circumstances of that release remain, to say the least, a bit murky. Um, you know, the president, uh, that is to say, President uh, Erdogan has said this was a very successful uh, operation by the Turkish National Intelligence Service. Um, okay, uh, that's interesting, but it doesn't really tell you exactly how this was accomplished. It doesn't appear to have been any kind of paramilitary, uh, you know, rescue or exfiltration operation. There seems to have been some kind of negotiation that, that MIT carried on with, uh, with ISIS in order to get this result, for which I think we can all be glad of the result. Um, uh, but uh, we don't really know what the terms of, of that were. 
And uh, I've seen reports in the Turkish press, for instance, that it involved an exchange of prisoners, that some ISIS prisoners were allowed to, to uh, leave Turkey, go back to Iraq. That may or may not be true. I don't know. I would only observe that I have not seen any senior authoritative Turkish government official deny it. Um, so uh, that's a very much a possibility as well in, in terms of affecting the government's calculations about how to respond to the current situation. There may well have been also other either explicit or implicit undertakings given to ISIS about what Turkey would or wouldn't do in the current coalition effort against ISIS. So this seems like the, the right time to maybe get a little further into depth about what's going on in Kobani. Ambassador Edelman, you said uh, sort of the Turkish attitude is this is happening on our borders, we have to live with it, you, the U U.S. are far away. Uh, yet what is happening on their borders, this ISIS siege of a, of a Syrian Kurdish-held town, um, and it's the U.S. that seems to be involved with airstrikes and trying to help lift the siege, and, and Turkey has been sort of hand, hands off in some respects. Um, so I don't know, Henri, can you give us a little more details about what's been going on on the ground in Kobani, and then maybe we can get into the Turkish response? Um. Look, I mean, we know what has been going on I mean, in the sense that ISIS has been, uh, has decided to invest an enormous amount of resources to take Kobani uh, away from uh, the Kurds. I mean, and Kobani's location is important in the sense that if you take Kobani, then you split the Kurdish regions into two, and the other two regions may become more susceptible to conquest by ISIS in the, in the long run. But I think ISIS also, I think, is attacking uh, the Kurds for a whole variety of other reasons because um, the Kurds clearly are not an integral part of, of the ISIS uh, vision. Uh, they don't buy into, uh, into what ISIS is trying to do. Um, th there's been already blood, blood, bad blood between ISIS and, and, the, and the Kurds for a long time. In terms of, to me, what, what makes Kobani very interesting is that I will venture to say, that I said this before elsewhere, that I think one day we will look back and say that Kobani is to Syrian and Turkish Kurds because the Turkish Kurds are so involved in this. What Halabja was for um, the Kurdistan regional government and Iraqi Kurds. Halabja, I remember, in 1988 was a sleepy little town that got hit, hit by chemical weapons uh, by Saddam Hussein at the, at the end of the Iran-Iraq war because the Kurds were, were at the time being used by the Iranians against the Iraqis, but they attacked essentially a civilian target. And um, people didn't pay attention. We certainly didn't pay attention. Uh, you know, at the time, the Iranians were a much bigger uh, threat to the United States and to the West, and therefore, um, Saddam was giving a great deal of leeway, and in a way, it was a shame on humanity that nothing happened. But this lack of attention and was very symbolic, I think, for the Kurds. That they, once again, they were being let down. Once again, nobody, the world did not care. But they came back by circumstance, luck, their own abilities, uh, and their own mistakes. But they came back, and today there is something called the Kurdistan Regional Government. And those of you who have ever been to northern Iraq, I mean, part of the uh, Halabja is part of the nation building symbols, like all nations have symbols, and Halabja is one of them. I mean, uh, you know, if you go to Israel, you go to Yad Vashem, the, uh, the memorial for the Holocaust, uh, and Halabja is essentially has the same uh, connotation for Iraqi Kurds. And you know, you're taken there, you're given the tour, you know, this is part of um, that made essentially KRG what it is today and Iraq and it's solidified if you want um, Iraqi Kurdish nationalism. I think Kobani is going to do will have the same impact down the road on Syrian and, and Turkish Kurds. And in fact the, the 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 paradox here is that the longer the siege lasts, the more important Kobani becomes because it becomes a play, you know, they're resisting. And also, there's another, I mean, you already are seeing the folklore emerging. I mean, one of the very important aspects of the Kobani resistance is, is the role of women, all right? I mean, all these stories are coming out about women fighters. I don't know if it's true or not, but the latest is that the whole 
uh, operation by uh, Syrian Kurds is led by a woman. I mean, so now there's a new, there's also another, if you want, um, um, narrative that is being developed about Kobani. So Kobani, I think you will go back one day and say, and say that Kobani was a very defining moment. And I think it, whether it is, is, remains in the hands of the Kurds or falls into ISIS, one way or the other, I think Kobani is going to become the, the Halabja. And so in that sense, I think we are looking down the road at a much more mobilized, and, you, and you're seeing, by the way, the reaction on Kobani, not just uh, in Turkey, but among other Kurdish communities around the world. You already are seeing for the first time, by the way, a break between the Iraqi Kurds who have been very supportive of this government in Turkey. Barzani and Erdogan had a very good relationship, and Barzani has come out swinging against Erdogan for his lack of support when uh, ISIS went on a rampage in northern Iraq and attacked Sinjar, etc. And, and add, by the way, to the, the, the PYD folklore is that the role that the PYD played in the rescuing of uh, the Yazidis in Sinjar. So now, the, you know, in the, in the Kurdish communities around the world, and especially in the region, the PYD is becoming very, very important and is becoming a symbol. So I think down the road, in a way, this has solidified um, the claims of the Syrian Kurds and has, in a way, strengthened, I think, the Kurdish movement writ large. Ambassador Elman, what has the Turkish response been to the siege of Kobani? You know, I, <clears throat> I think really Henri has addressed this already. I mean, I think they have largely seen this uh, <clears throat> through the lens of the negotiations with the, uh, with the PKK inside Turkey um, and the desire to uh, cut the PKK down to size a little bit um, and diminish them. I do think there's a huge danger of this, you know, blowing up in the government's face. So you already see it uh, in southeastern Turkey. Um, but I, I think that's how they see this and that's how they're um, responding. And I think it's one of the reasons why um, the U.S. has found it um, a little, uh, little challenging uh, to work with Turkey as a NATO ally as the administration tries to put together this coalition to, um, to uh, in the president's words, degrade uh, and destroy ISIS or IS. What would the significance be? Hon Henri touched about this from the, from the Kurdish perspective, but what would the significance be sort of from the U.S. perspective in terms of fighting ISIS of Kobani's fall? If, if ISIS were to capture Kobani, would it have a strategic significance? Well, I think, I, yes, it will have a strategic significance. I mean, for ISIS, look, the, it, it has now become essentially a do or die thing. Not, I wouldn't say do or die thing, but a, a symbolically it's something very, very important for ISIS. I, ISIS has to win in its own mind because this will be the first major um, defeat, if you want, for, for ISIS. Right? It can be pushed back in certain locations. It has been pushed back in many different locations. But such a concerted siege for such a long time, and if it doesn't succeed, you know, it will be um, a, a chink in ISIS, ISIS's armor. So I, from, from a Kurdish perspective, uh, yes, it's, of course it's a disaster because they will lose a lot of people. They will lose a strategic location. They're going to have to win it back. It's going to mean more bloodshed for them. Uh, but, I mean, from a political, long-term strategic perspective, I think I, either way the Kurds become stronger. It's an interesting question about, you know, what, what is strategic and what isn't. Um, so uh, when the siege of uh, Kobani first uh, began and uh, when Henri and I were in the rather lengthy process of writing our joint op-ed together, uh, and that had nothing to do with any differences between the two of us, by the way. It just had to do with uh, moving events and, and the press. But, um, you know, you heard a lot or you saw a lot of um, blind quotes from uh, unidentified senior U.S. officials, mostly defense officials, uh, saying, you know, Kobani really isn't very strategically important in the fight against ISIS. Um, and, uh, you know, this was in a period when Henri and I were actually trying to get, among other things, the U.S. government to take the siege of Kobani more seriously. You know, now, from a certain point of view, I understand what those people uh, were saying because um, 
in a certain sense, there's nothing particular about Kobani or Ain al-Arab, uh, as it's called in the Syrian side, um, uh, as part of this larger fight. And in fact, all the attention that has gone to Kobani because the media uh, understandably would rather sit in Turkey looking into Kobani where the chances of being beheaded are a lot lower than if you go into Iraq to cover what's going on in Iraq. But while the siege of Kobani has been going on, uh, ISIS has actually been very, very active in Anbar province and, um, uh, and over the uh, weekend had some notable successes that are uh, bringing uh, Baghdad into, um, uh, into range of indirect fire and uh, potentially uh, encroachment by, by uh, ISIS forces uh, to the point that uh, General Dempsey has had to reposition some assets, and I'm sure my colleagues in the State Department are already uh, working with their Defense Department colleagues to dust off plans for the NEO, the uh, non-combatant evacuation operation, or at least I hope they are. Uh, they should be. Um, we have some people in the audience who have some experience with this, and I'm sure they would agree with that. Um, but uh, you know, in some sense, what's going on in Iraq could be seen as much more strategically important than than Kobani. Having said that, I think uh, Henri is exactly right. Um, you know, these things can take on a symbolic importance beyond the intrinsic, um, you know, military um, uh, significance of a, of, of a particular place. And in this case, I think it is significant because um, it would be, well, as Henri and I argued, having elevated ISIS to the level we have uh, by uh, presidential decision um, to allow them to succeed here uh, would be a, a, a very, very big setback, I think, uh, in Syria and in Iraq. So obviously, sorry. No, I just was, look, let's face it. I mean, for an American perspective, Iraq is the most important issue here. From the beginning, Iraq was the most important. Iraq was more important from, than Syria two years ago. And I think where the administration uh, made a mistake was not to pay enough attention to what was going on in Iraq, not to realize, not to realize that the border between Iraq and Syria had disappeared, that if for all intents and purposes people were crossing on both sides of the, uh, of the borders, uh, and, um, and then suddenly ISIS takes over and then people are surprised, but th the truth is there was a, uh, a gradual, very perceptible deterioration of the situation in, in Iraq that uh, the Obama administration should have uh, been much more uh, proactive about. Um, but from given everything that, ha you know, given the importance of Iraq for the United States, given the fact that you know, we, we've lost so many people in Iraq, given the fact that uh, Iraq's, its oil wealth, its strategic location for, is far, far, far more important than Syria. And uh, in a way, United States can tolerate a civil war in Syria that goes ad infinitum, but not one in Iraq, right? And that's, the, that's, very, that's a very important distinction that, and, and the focus for the administration has, still has to be how, do, how does the Iraqi government and the Kurdish uh, forces in the north regroup, reorganize, and start pushing ISIS back in, in Iraq. And that's, that's, that's a game. And, and part of the Obama administration's strategy has tr been to try to build an international coalition that will support that. And it's pursued Turkey to be part of that coalition rather vigorously. Uh, and I guess over the weekend we heard from the National Security Advisor, Susan Rice, there might be good news on that front. So sort of where do things stand today, Ambassador Edelman? Well, this goes to your point about our inability uh, to agree uh, with the Turks on what we either agree or disagree about. Um, and I've got some personal experience of um, use of Inchelik uh, Air Force Base and how, uh, how, that, how that works. Um, you know, look, I, I have enormous regard uh, for uh, uh, John Allen. Um, I, I've worked with John. He's one of the very best uh, general officers I've ever worked with, um, and I have enormous amount of confidence in him. Um, and I think he was a very uh, shrewd choice for the president in terms of uh, someone to um, put together this coalition to uh, oppose um, ISIS. Uh, that being said, I suspect, like uh, others, uh, he will find uh, that 
the Turks are going to be one of the most difficult partners we have in all of this. And that is not new. I mean, I think, um, you know, Turkey has been a problematic, difficult NATO ally now for, for a number of years uh, on an, and on a number of fronts. So uh, I don't think any of that is new. And then given the context that uh, Henri and I have been talking about, it's not altogether surprising. Uh, Turkey does have some concerns that it doesn't feel are being addressed by the United States. So it stands to reason they would want, um, you know, to, um, to get certain kinds of commitments about what the U.S. is or isn't willing to do before it determines what it, for its part, uh, might, you know, be, might be willing to do. And uh, allowing, for instance, the United States to use Intralic to uh, fly strike missions against ISIS could present some problems for, for Turkey in the sense that it would open them up to retaliation inside Turkey. Um, and blowback. Now, they've already faced some of this with the bombing in Rahanla uh, a year or so ago. Uh, so it's not as if this is, you know, a theoretical possibility. It's a very real possibility. And in a context where you already have a lot of uh, turmoil in southeastern Turkey, although I would say some of that's been brought about by government policy um, on this Kurdish question, um, you know, it's, it's understandable that, that uh, at some level Turkey would um, you know, would be doing what it's, what it's doing. That, that being said, uh, it's very frustrating uh, as an ally to have to try and, um, you know, manage all of this. Well, I mean, as I said earlier, I mean, for, for the United States, the priority is Iraq. It's not Syria. For uh, Erdogan, the priority is Syria, well, specifically Assad. So from that very beginning, from the starting point, we don't have the same, same priorities. And the Turks have always wanted us to create a no-fly zone or, a, uh, or uh, zones to protect uh, across the border with, with, that we would have to, to maintain with, uh, the, with aircraft from wherever, I mean, from Injilic, obviously. Uh, and that the United States doesn't want to do because it sees that as a, the beginning of a potential military involvement in Syria, which it, it's, it's trying to avoid at all, at all costs. So, you know, the, you, you have a, a bargaining uh, si situation here. I, as Eric said, look, the most important thing that the United States wants from Turkey is the, the ability to use strike aircraft from Injilic. At the moment, strike aircraft are coming from essentially two varied locations. The, the fleet in the Mediterranean, the fleet in, um, in, um, in uh, the Persian Gulf, and in Doha. But it's, the problem with from the Mediterranean is that you have to fly over Syrian uh, Syrian air defenses, and it, you don't know what the Syrian air defenses will do. Uh, but on, from from the perspective of um, from the Gulf, it's a much much longer distance. So aircraft have to be refueled in the air. They can't hover over over targets. You also have to uh, you, you need closer assets. And Injilik is a stone's throw away from the from where the fighting is happening in terms of north, both in that northern Iraq and in. Um, in Kobani and that, in, in that region. So that's what the United States wants. What we saw this weekend happen, I, look, it clearly the Turks have not agreed to allow strike aircraft. Maybe Susan Rice was referring to another part of the agreement in terms of allowing for Injilic to be used for refueling operations, for UAVs, whatever. I don't know. But, you know, the, the favors, my favorite line on this is, you know, you remember that movie Cool Hand Luke? where um, the, the, the prison warden says to Paul Newman, what we have here is a failure to communicate. And that's clearly what's happening between Turkey. But that's, as Eric said, that has always been the case. And it's not new. It's not new, by the way, to, to uh, American relations under, under the AKP. It precedes the AKP. I mean, it's always been uh, difficult to, to communicate uh, on these issues. There have always been different priorities. In the 1990s, it was the way we looked at northern Iraq. The Turks looked at northern Iraq one way and we did another way. That all these things, situations have sometimes even flipped uh, and we don't seem to be able to, to communicate with the Turks very well. And, um, and that's what's happening. I think there's going to be a long bargaining pro uh, situation uh, process. Uh, it's not going to help Kobani that much in, in the short term, but this is what we have. I would say that <coughs> I, I strikes me uh, that it was uh, really ill-advised 
uh, for the National Security Advisor to go out and, and trumpet a new commitment from Turkey uh, if it wasn't completely, you know, nailed down uh, and uh, nailed down in concrete. Um, so my, I, I think that may, you know, have been a, a, an error, and, and it's a particularly egregious error because <clears throat> I think it contributes to something that we already are suffering from, which is uh, I think there is a kind of uh, uh, problem of what I call political moral hazard, which we have run into with Turkey a lot over the last decade, and that's this is a bipartisan policy center um, uh, session, so I'm going to be totally bipartisan in my my criticism, I think this applies equally to the Bush administration and to the Obama administration, which is we have. But more to the Bush administration. I think it applies equally. I'll 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 let you apportion the blame how how you see fit, uh, Henri. But um, we have communicated uh, by what we have said and what we have done uh, over a decade uh, that we think uh, Turkey is absolutely essential to what we do and that it's irreplaceable and that, that we need Turkey more than Turkey needs the United States, NATO, and the West. I think that's a mistake. Um, and I think that we, at our peril, continue to do this because by saying we have a commitment uh, and then allowing the Turks to say, no, you don't, it puts us to be continually in the position of being the demandeur and, and having to sue for you know, for, you know, greater um, concessions. Um, we ran into this, I mean, a lot of what happened, a lot of what went wrong in 2003 uh, with the potential entry of the 4th Infantry Division into Turkey, uh, you know, uh, was a function of the same kind of, uh, of inability to uh, manage our communications. I mean, as, as Henri says, this is a huge, you know, diplomatic failure. Um, if we constantly convey that we have to have Turkey as part of this coalition, then the price, you know, of admission is going to go up. Uh, my own view is that the relationship at this point, uh, rather than having the, um, I mean, obviously the vice president's comments uh, didn't help either in this regard because that forced an apology by the vice president. Uh, the, but the constant phone calls, uh, constant visits by senior officials to Ankara, et cetera, I think are contributing uh, not to making the relationship uh, well, but actually getting, you know, making things worse. And I, I think this is a relationship at this point that could, would actually benefit from a, a little bit of what I call benign neglect. So can I just, I, I don't know if Susan Rice was right or wrong. I mean, that's, but, but there is also another way of looking at the same thing, and that is to say that the pressure on Turkey now to be part, to participate is actually increasing. I mean, the price may be going up for Turkey and not for us in the sense that, especially after the National Security Advisor says we have a deal, the Turks says we don't have a deal, that's not how you make friends in Washington and, and, and certainly in the White House. Um, so I, maybe there's another way of, of passing this thing and that remember that the, the mood in Washington with respect to Turkey has changed quite dramatically, especially on the Hill. So the, I think the fact that you have coalition aircraft now hitting ISIS positions in, in Syria, uh, the fact that there's a lot of Buha, there's a meeting today um, in, in Washington of the military chiefs. I mean, I think the fact that the Turks will find that they're being on the outside is, being, is very uncomfortable. So all that being said, and I don't dispute anything Henri just said, I, I still would be quite surprised if, in the end of the day, we are allowed to fly strike aircraft out of Interlook. So last question before I turn it over to the audience to, to put you both on the spot a little bit. Who does need who more in this situation? Does, does the U.S. need Turkey more than Turkey needs the U.S.? And, and if it is a failure to communicate, Henri, then what, what tools does the U.S. have, whether carrots or sticks, at its disposal to uh, to make communication easier? Look, this is a $64,000 question. I mean, um, it really requires a great deal of rethinking. I'm looking at it from essentially American policy perspective. 
Uh, there is no such thing, especially given Turkey's location, there is no such thing as one require, needing mo the other more. I mean, the United States brings certain things to the table, Turkey brings certain things to the table. I think they're both indispensable to each other. In fact, when you look at um, uh, the daily relationship between Turkey and the United States, there are very, very few countries in the world where there are so many <coughs> Uh, exchanges of information, exchanges of visits, exchanges, I mean, at the bureaucratic level, at the working level uh, of people talking to each other constantly because there are many issues over which the, the two countries have common interests. Um, and there are issues over which, by the way, they also differ, that they need to work those differences out because they can be very, very uh, destructive to the relationship. So it's not the fact that you, you have common interests, but also when you diverge, it's very important to, to talk about these things because those divergences can result in very potentially catastrophic results. So um, look at the countries around the world, maybe the British, maybe, uh, I don't know, maybe the French. I mean, there are very few countries, the Japanese, with whom we have such an intense relationship. So I wouldn't say, I mean, yes, the Turks always think that the United States needs them more than they, they need the United States, but that's a fallacy. Um, I don't think the United States, anybody thinks that Turkey needs us more than we need them. Um, they don't necessarily think, but look, we're a superpower. I mean, still, still, maybe until tomorrow, but um, we are a superpower and you know that we, we bring certain things to the table that the Turks cannot, and in that sense, it is in the interest of the Turks to work with us. Um, but every government has a different perspective, a different way of doing things, and that's, uh, that's what we're seeing now with, with, with Turkey. In terms of how to redress this problem, um, maybe Eric and I will be writing a paper on this, so you can wait for that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I agree largely with what Henri said, but let me just add one additional point to it, <clears throat> which is, I mean, obviously both the United States and Turkey need each other. That, I think, goes without saying. Um, I think part of the problem, and this is something we've addressed as a task force in other papers, is that when it comes to Turkish foreign policy, because of the increasing trend towards authoritarianism and centralization of political power in Turkey, <clears throat> um, you know, I used to say that it, the only two people who mattered were the prime minister and the foreign minister. Now with uh, President Erdogan's ascension to uh, the presidential palace in Chankaya, you know, it appears to me that the only two people who matter are the prime minister and the president, and maybe we'll see whether the foreign minister matters or not. I, mean, I have my doubts. Um, but uh, that, you know, that creates, uh, you know, really this problem of uh, political moral hazard, because when you're dealing with only two people, and particularly when you're dealing with two people who's as I said, whose you know, personal psychologies are so wrapped up in this particular conflict. Uh, I think that makes um, you know, the management, the alliance management of, of this extremely tricky. In particular, when you've got two individuals who are already inclined to overstate their world historical significance. All right, with that, we'll take questions from the audience. Please wait for the microphone, introduce yourself, uh, and keep your questions brief right here up front. Yes. Okay, my name is Wayne Young with Port of Harlem Magazine, and my question is to both of you all, and that is, historically, uh, why didn't the powers that be that created all these states never create a Kurdistan in the first place? I'm going to defer that to Henri, <laughs> who's the Kurdish expert. Uh, look, great powers do whatever is convenient for them. I mean, the Sev Treaty of 1920 essentially said that the Kurds would have some kind of autonomy um, in Turkey, but that never came to be obvious, since the Sev Treaty was never, uh, not independence, but the uh, Sev Treaty was never, never came into existence. Um, look, they drew the boundaries to the, the British and the French, drew, drew, drew the boundaries uh, to, their, to their own liking, their own strategic interests. I mean, they played games. I mean, all you have to do is look at the way the, but it's not just in the Middle East, but it's also other parts of the world where they, so why they didn't do it? I mean, they had their own calculations at the time and they, you, they could get away with it. It was a different era. 
you know, I, one thing, I mean, Henri really is the expert here, but uh, one thing I would say is that looking at the region writ large, and I'm talking about now not just, you know, Turkey, Syria, and Iraq, which is what we have been focused on this morning, <clears throat> but if you look from Libya all the way, you know, to Iran, the sort of um, territorial dispensation that we are all used to that is the outcome of uh, of the turmoil after World War I with the nation state boundaries that came about as a result of that uh, is up for grabs in a way that I don't think any of us have ever experienced in, in our lives. And I think one of the arguments, uh, I, uh, perhaps the administration has wielded this with the, uh, with the Turks, I hope they have, uh, if not they should, is that if if we're not successful in defeating ISIS um, uh, at some point, the potential for Iraq and Syria both to fragment, to become Humpty Dumpty and become uh, impossible to put back together again means that there will be, finally, de facto, a Kurdish state or states emerging. And so if Turkey wants to shape that reality now before it is you know, imposed on Turkey. Um, the time to do that with other international partners is now, not to wait. Gentleman on, the, on my left. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Namo Abdullah. I'm with Rudao News Network in Kurdistan. Uh, I have a question for both of you. Uh, in 2003, when the United States uh, invaded Iraq, Turkey refused to cooperate the same way it does now on ISIS. But at that time, the United States chose Iraqi Kurds as an ally against Saddam Hussein. Is it reasonable to expect the same thing is happening now with Syrian Kurds? Can we expect the United States uh, choosing Syrian Kurds as an alternative in the fight against ISIS? Well, I, I would take issue a little bit with the premise of your question. I mean, first, uh, and there's a lot of misunderstanding about this, the, the March 1st vote uh, in 2003 about the, uh, about the um, 4th Infantry Division entry into Iraq, northern Iraq through Turkey, um, failed, but it failed um, as the result of a, a parliamentary um, point of order uh, because there wasn't a quorum present um, of, uh, there wasn't a majority of those present in voting because so many abstentions uh, had taken place during the vote. Actually, the Tezkede, the motion for uh, allowing uh, the um, 4th Infantry Division into Turkey, actually had a plurality. It had, I think, uh, 14 more votes than, um, than op opponents. Uh, the problem was they were four short of a majority of those present in voting. Um, I mean, subsequently, uh, Turkey did open its airspace uh, to the United States. Uh, there was a lot of cooperation uh, with the United States after that. Um, uh, yes, I mean, it's certainly true uh, that the United States um, developed very close relationships uh, with, uh, with the uh, Iraqi Kurds in, in what is now the KRG. Um, but that was always in the cards because they were part of the INC, they were part of the uh, the Iraqi opposition, and so I think that was in an inevitability. Um, and uh, and it also is also true that U.S. Turkish relations went through a very bumpy patch uh, after the March first vote, and I'm I, I have some of the bumps still on my body as a result of all that. Um, but I, I think uh, you know we've also had very good cooperation. You know, subsequently on some issues with Turkey, so it's it's a little bit more mixed picture, I think, than than you know um, your question suggests. Having said that, um, I, I mean I think Syrian Kurds are inevitably, just as Iraqi Kurds emerged in a post-Saddam uh, Iraq as a important uh, factor, I think Syrian Kurds in a post-Assad Syria are, are going to emerge as a very important factor as well. I think that's just a reality. Uh, All right, next question. Tolga. Uh, actually, can I uh, follow up to Norman's question? Sure. Uh, 
Yeah, but, but the Syrian Kurds... Introduce, the, introduce yourself. Yeah, the Tolgatan is with you yet. Uh, I had a follow-up to Norman's question, actually. It's very complicated comparing the KRG situation when it comes to the Syrian Kurds because, you know, the, the question is complicated because of the PKK relations because PYD is very close to PKK right. and somehow right. offshoot of PKK, etc. But when it comes to the point that the Henry said, uh, the Susan Rice remarks and uh, immediately the reaction from Turkish side, there will be some consequences for Turkey because of these differences, it's obvious. And the Turkey is uh, very cautious about the Syrian curse and the cooperation, uh, the possibility between these groups and US. Uh, maybe US ramped up the air strikes in Kobani after the demonstration in Turkey because in the first 15 days there were only 12 air strikes in Kobani, but after the dem demonstrations this skyrocketed to 60. 46 in just four days. So there is there is a, a sensi sensitivity in the U.S. administration, but the concretely, given all the com com the complex situation in terms of the PKK, etc., what will be the consequences of this U.S. approach to the region in terms of the relationship between U.S. and the Syrian Kurds? But for example, U.S. is not issuing visa to Salih Mus Muslim. Can the administration issue that visa after these differences between Turkey and U.S. Concrete question. I mean, let me let me just add. First of all, there is a difference between Syrian Kurds and Iraqi Kurds. In 2003, the United States had been working with the Iraqi Kurds since 1991, since the end of the Gulf War. So we had a history of talking to and. W we were there, we, we actually uh, we, we worked when the KDP and the PUK were fighting, we mediated between them, we brought both Barzani and Talabani to sign a peace deal, um, Madeleine Albright brought them to Washington. We so, were flying, uh, we were doing Operation Provide Comfort. Right, we were doing Provide Comfort, Northern so there was Watch. a great deal. So, so when you talk about, to also answer your question, when you talk about the Syrian Kurds, there is no history of American um, cooperation with the Syrian Kurds. So it's very difficult, especially for a military, to suddenly um, cooperate with a group it, does, it doesn't know. But Tolga, your question is about, I don't think the increase in the number of strikes have anything to do with the increase in you know, demonstrations in Turkey. They're completely irrelevant. Partially, partly, I think it's technical. Technical in the sense that Actually, I was talking to an Apache pilot the other day who told me, look, when we, get when, when we have to strike, we care about who gives us the information. Right? So if you don't have reliable source of information, information on the ground in terms of telling you where to, to hit, you're not going to hit. So part of the reason why the United States was, did not hit initially, I mean, it's only, I think it explains maybe 50% of the variance, um, has to do with the fact that they didn't have reliable information. It is possible that the YPG and, or, P, or the PYD, the YPG being the uh, military arm of the PYD, and U.S. military now have a way of communicating and talking to each other that is more reliable and therefore there's actionable intelligence upon which the United States can hit. Right. The other reason I think the Tur the, 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 the America was worried about Turkey's reaction in terms of helping the PYD, which I think uh, which is also explains the initial reluctance on, on the part. But having people on the ground or having reliable sources, it takes time to build, to build those things. So that also explains why the ramp up. Um, and finally, there's also um, clearly much more interest and concern about Kobani. Kobani has become very important. Right, and so the U.S. is also reacting to that psychologically. Well, and I would just add one other thing. I mean, I, I agree with Henri. I mean, there's the more restrictive targeting policy the president announced almost two years ago, which clearly has had an impact. There's some of the um, the logistical factors that Henri has talked about, <clears throat> the the um, and the growing importance of Kobani. The other thing is the situation in Kobani itself, which has become m much more um, much more dangerous and perilous because of ISIS advances, uh, which is why I think you've seen a, a, you know, an increase in airstrikes as well. I, I, I agree with Henri Tolga. I don't think it has very much to do with what's gone on in southeastern Turkey. Oh, the visa issue, I mean, I'll, I'll leave that to, to Henri because he knows more about this. Look, I, I, to me, the, to the American government sometimes is a bigger mystery than most places. I mean. Uh, I, I don't understand why they don't do this. It's partially, uh, it's again, 
it goes a little bit to the U.S.-Turkish relationship uh, and, and the fear of, of how the Turks will react. Um, but remember that today we have three terrorism lists in the United States, two by the State Department and one from the Department of Homeland Security. The KDP and the PUK, two groups we have to fought with, we have worked with, the, the, Kurd, the two Kurdish parties in Iraq are on the third terrorism list. And Congress, can't, Congress put them there, but Congress can't take them out. So there are all kinds of political reasons also, which I'm, I'm sorry, bureaucratic reasons why this may not also be happening. I, could, I can't tell. Who knows? Right here up front. Uh, my name is Yerevan Said. I work for Rodeo News, the English version, by the way. My colleagues work for the TV. Uh, by the way, thanks for mentioning Halabja. I'm, I'm survivable of Halabja, by the way. Uh, I have, you know, one question. So if Turkey is serious about the peace, uh, full settlement for the Kurdish question in, in Turkey, why it doesn't try to develop a working relation with the PYD or, uh, in, in Syria? Because these two are very uh, separable, and Ocalan has, you know, threatened or has warned that uh, the fall of Kobani, or if something you know bad happens in in Syrian Kurdistan, that will impact the peace process in in Turkey. Look, my take is um, that both President Erdogan and Prime Minister Davutoglu are very very confident of their own position with respect to the peace process. Why? Uh, they think that the Turkish Kurds have no place to go in Turkey but the government. Look, this government, this political party has gone the furthest in terms of acknowledging Kurdish rights, in terms of initiating, I mean, who would have thought that the Turkish government would be negotiating with Öcalan, the baby killer, as the Turkish press, uh, or still, some of the press still refers to, right? So from a position where, you know, you, the, the military used to instruct the press to, to when they use the word Öcalan, also use the word baby killer, We've gone to a situation, I mean, that takes an enormous amount of courage and an enormous amount of, um, uh, well, let's leave it at, at courage. So, so I think the Turkish government thinks that, yes, there is, there's a problem of Kobani now, there are problems with the Syrian Kurds, but down the road, Turkish Kurds have no other place to go to. Because CHP has not done enough on the Kurdish question. The other political party, MHP, is the only raison d'etre it has is to be against the Kurds. So where are the Kurds going to go in the Turkish political spectrum? Also add to this the fact that the Kurds in Turkey are divided into, into essentially pro-BDP, say pro-PKK, and also pro-AKP. So there is a natural division within uh, the Turkish Kurdish community. And that, um, so with that, the government feels that six months down the road, there may be problems now with the peace process, but the Kurds will forget and they'll go back to the peace process. But it is very, very important in the meantime to prevent the Syrian Kurds from getting autonomy. I think that is the only way I can explain it. I mean, maybe there's another explanation. Maybe it's completely, what I'm saying is completely irrelevant. But that's the only way you can explain. But I actually think that's a mistake. But Right. That's I'm another issue. I mean, th there's an, it's a question about whether this is a correct calculation right. about but, whether this is going right. to but, work but, or not. But look, both Erdogan and Davutoglu are supremely self-confident. They think they can manage things. They thought they could manage Syria. They, they couldn't. But, um, but they do think that they can manage the situations. Right? So there is, and they have a lot of assets in their hands that they can use. Anything to add? Next question. Over here in the middle. Hi, my name is Erica Hanachek. I'm with United for Free Syria. And you touched on no-fly zones, and I'd like to revisit that issue. Um, I know you mentioned U.S. reticence to get involved in Turkish desire to set up a no-fly zone, but it becomes very clear as we move forward with anti-ISIS uh, airstrikes that they're not doing enough to really address the issue. The only thing that they've really achieved is to alienate the Syrian street. So I was wondering if you had any ideas about the prospects of U.S.-Turkish cooperation on no-fly zones, whether or not they'd be effective, and then how that would affect the Turkish relationship vis-a-vis -vis the Kurds. Thank you. I mean, I think actually, you know, uh, the problem is we're, we're, we may be beyond the point where a no-fly zone 
you know, makes that much you know, difference. I mean, I think it could have made a big difference uh, a couple of years ago. Um, I think you would have wanted more than no fly zone. I think you would have wanted probably no drive zone in some areas as well. <clears throat> and I think that could have been affected at relatively low cost at the time uh, if we'd had cooperation from Turkey and, and others. Um, I'm not sure at this point um, how easy it would be to do um, given what's happened in Syria over the last three years. Um, although I would add that um, Henri made reference to the uh, Syrian IADs, the integrated air defenses, which have been uh, trumpeted by you know, General Dempsey and others as one of the obstacles to you know, greater uh, act activity here. I personally have never taken that problem very seriously. I don't think it's a serious problem. Um, and uh, I don't think it would take a six-week air campaign to defeat the Syrian integrated air defense. I think we could do it a lot quicker. Look, I, I think the United States sees any type of no-fly zone, certainly no drive zone, as the beginning of a slip, slippery slope. Right, and the truth is, um, I think if the Turks were smart about this, they would have given the United States complete access to Injilik to use it as for strike aircraft and everything, because that would have been one way of bringing Turkey, uh, United States into Syria, into Iraq, much more deeply, and once and, and begin the slippery slope. Uh, so that, that I think there's a paradox there. But I think the United States does not want to get involved. And look, uh, you have to respect Obama's wish not to start another war with another Middle East country. I mean, um, I, I'm sorry, the, the image that comes to mind is uh, Colbert, uh, Steve Colbert the other day on, t on, on his show where he, you know, he punched another Muslim country with bombing. I mean, let's face it, that's the last thing Obama wants to do. Right, last question. Over here on the left. Hi, my name is Mahir Ayhan. I'm a, I'm a PhD student at George Washington University. Uh, so Turkey apparently wants a Sunni Arab state in its south uh, border, and preferably ruled by Muslim brotherhoods. And U.S. approaches to preserve the status quo, you know, the concern about stability of the region, uh, and they kind of say, okay, wait, I will find two better dictators, better than uh, Assad and Maliki, and we'll keep the stability, you know, safe. Uh, don't you think both approaches problematic? And don't you think having a confederation over there will be a better idea? Thank you. <clears throat> well, I actually don't think the U.S. approach, either in the Bush or the Obama administration, has been to, to support dictators. Um, I think actually it's been something that may be less achievable, which is to preserve or to create, um, not preserve because it doesn't exist, but to um, create a more pluralistic um, system in both uh, Iraq and Syria that would provide certain guarantees for the rights of ethnic and sectarian minorities. Um, I think that's been the objective. Uh, how well that's been executed is a whole other question. Um, and, and, I mean, I would agree that um, there was, particularly over the last few years, an over-reliance on uh, Prime Minister Maliki, who was taking on also authoritarian and, and dictatorial tendencies, which I think are, are problematic. But I don't think it's fair to say that the United States w wants to see, uh, you know, and maybe at this point some people would just as soon see another dictator in Syria who could... Um, you know, somehow impose, uh, reimpose order, but I think we're so far beyond that now. I just don't think there's any prospect of that happening. Look, the, the, um, I think the one gap in the Obama administration's Syria policy has been the absence of any attempt by the administration to address the Syrian public but all of the Syrian public, not just the opposition, but also those who support the, the, um, the Assad regime. Look, this war has been going on for three years. Put yourself in the shoes of the other white community. You've been losing men after men, boys after boys fighting. And the ISIS 
in fact, the ISIS crisis has all given a, gave an opportunity to the Obama administration, to Obama himself, and he, he did not use it. Because imagine if you're the mother and father of a child, of a son who's going to go to fight. He's 17 years old. He's going to be uh, in, uh, taken into the Syrian army, and you've just seen all those images of all, those two soldiers who were marching to the desert and, and, and massacred by ISIS. And your son might, might be one of them to ne next year, and why is he fighting? Because of Assad. This is the moment, essentially, to say to, to the Alawite community, saying, look, if you rid of yourself of Assad, we will work with whomever comes to power, and we will help you. The common enemy is ISIS. We'll, work, you know, we'll, we'll, bring in every, we'll try to bring in everybody. Just give some element of hope, something to look forward to, some incentive to the Alawites in Syria that there is a way out. Otherwise, you're pushing them into Assad's hands, and he has them like this. You need to break that fist that, uh, or open that fist that Assad has over the, the Alawite community, which thinks that it's either him or death. But it isn't. Right? It, uh, ISIS is going to consume more and more and more um, young men and there is a limit. The, I mean, in terms of the support base of uh, the Assad regime, that support base is, given the number of refugees that are given, the amount of territory that's outside Assad's control, is essentially getting smaller and smaller. Right? And at some point, the Alawites are also going to say, but uh, enough is enough. Maybe they are saying that. There, there are signs that they are saying that, but I think the administration has not, unfortunately, uh, taken advantage of that. Any concluding thoughts? That was mine. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much for coming. Thank you to both Ambassador Edelman and, and Dr. Barkey. Thank you. I encourage you to check out our papers and analyses on U.S.-Turkey relations at bipartisanpolicy.org and to come back next week to hear Ambassador Edelman and Michelle Flournoy talk about defense budget issues. <laughs>